Thank you. Uh, again, uh, my name is David Smith. I'm with uh, Texas A&M University and College Station, and I'm with the Bio and Ag Engineering Department. And uh, also, I'm the, uh, the uh, I guess you'd say the project manager or coordinator for the Animal Ag and Climate Change Project uh, Southwest region, which is, uh, covers anywhere from Arizona, Louisiana, up to Kansas, and includes Colorado, New Mexico, and uh, Arkansas as well. But um, uh, Jenny asked me to talk about the ABCs of farm greenhouse gases. Uh, she felt like there would be some, some producers in here that maybe didn't have a background in some of this. I know we've heard some se several speakers already this morning about this subject, but if you're like me, if you have to hear it about 10 times before it really you know, sinks in. But hopefully I'll be presenting some, some of the same information, but maybe in a different way, with, which would help drive home some of the, the points. Um, the objectives here to, uh, today, I want to define what greenhouse gases are. Just briefly again, uh, provide a perspective on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, discuss the origin of greenhouse gases in livestock and, and poultry systems, mainly in livestock and particularly dairy in particular, uh, and then present some strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions on farms. If you look at the different greenhouse gases, basically they're gases that absorb and emit uh, thermal radiation. That's heat in the atmosphere. So that's what these gases, what makes them unique. Um, we have both natural and synthetic greenhouse gases. Natural, of course, being uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane. Also, uh, the one that uh, in the most abundant is, is water vapor. Um, and then also we have ozone that uh, is natural also. And then we have a, a, a host of different synthetic gases that are produced uh, during industrial processes that also retain thermal radiation when they're in the atmosphere. And so, you know, of course the important thing here with the, the greenhouse gases is that we absolutely need them to survive. Uh, if we didn't have them, our planet would be uh, pretty much frozen. I talked to Pam Knox earlier this morning and I said, well, you know, what's the zero, if, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, you know, does that mean on the dark side of the earth would it be freezing and the, on the other side of earth, you know, the uh, exposed to sunlight, would we be burning up? She goes, well, I never thought about that. But, yeah, the zero is just an average, okay? Um, so we would be sort of like the other planets in our uh, galaxy that uh, uh, don't have an atmosphere or at least didn't have greenhouse gases. And so... What these graphs show, though, is, is, is the concern uh, that we've had is that all of these greenhouse gases are tending to rise, and it looks like most of them are rising in uh, a linear fashion. Uh, and this is a very short time span, uh, the last, you know, what, 40 years or so. Uh, but you can trace it back even further, and you can... Uh, Go back to the our industrial revolution. We always throw out this term industrial revolution. Well, it was actually the U.S. industrial revolution that we're referring to. We can see and sort of track the increased uh, emissions uh, in these different gases from those time spans around uh, 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 1950. And so this particular chart, there's a lot of information here, but basically what it shows is that pre-1950 concentrations here and our current con concentrations of these gases here in this. And you'll see that, you know, a lot of these are, they're, they're exist in, in small concentrations in the atmosphere, but the amount that they're going up is quite substantial uh, relative to their uh, pre-industrial concentration. And you'll notice that the gases down here at the bottom, these are all uh, uh, synthetic gases where basically we had no concentration in the atmosphere, and then now we have uh, we have some. So we've been able to track that uh, with better measurement devices over time. The other thing in this column we have global warming potential. Um, depending on the source that you're referencing, uh, you'll see these numbers. A, uh, the global warming potential of carbon dioxide is is one, nearly in all, in all cases. 
And then for methane, depending upon the time horizon that they define this term, it'll range anywhere from 21 to, I've seen it to 29 to 30. Uh, but basically what this is, is uh, uh, relative to carbon dioxide, what is the heat retaining property or capacity of this gas? And so here with nitrous oxide, it's around 300, means it has, uh, it's, holds about 300 times more heat than an equivalent amount of carbon dioxide. And then all these gases, pretty much they exist in the atmosphere at different times. And this is another source of a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so depending on the source, you'll see some different numbers here. But uh, at the, 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 the length of time that they exist in the atmosphere uh, ranges here from uh, CO2, 100 to 300 years. And so uh, you'll notice some of the uh, more synthetic uh, greenhouse gases have really long uh, atmospheric lifetimes. And so really the concern is, is uh, the apparent correlation uh, uh, to uh, recent uh, warming, global warming, the atmosphere. Here in the red line we see the CO2 concentration is pretty much linear increase. And then we have uh, an overall increase in the last but uh, 75 years, or going back to this produced equivalent charts that go back to the uh, beginning of the century, where you can actually, if you extrapolate over that entire time horizon, you'll see an increase in global warming. Uh, but you'll also notice there's a lot of variability uh, within that as well. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the concentration of the, the, the larger perspective about greenhouse gases, where they're coming for and what coming from and what they're attributed to. Um, this is a resource from the World Resources Institute. This shows the top 10 emitters. Uh, this is total greenhouse gas emissions by country. And as we learned earlier this morning, uh, China is by far the, uh, the, the largest emitter of, of total greenhouse gases and that's uh, followed by us and then the European Union. If you look at per capita emissions for the top 10 emitters, uh, I would have thought it would have been US, but at least according to the World Resource Institute, it's Canada. It's on a per capita basis. It's followed by United States and Russia. And if you'll see China is still sort of in the middle of the, the pack here at the bottom. Uh, but that is projected to increase as the, their economy improves. Okay, so overall, if you look at the latest figures we have for global uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 equivalents, there's a total uh, of about 49,000 million metric tons of anthropogenic um, CO2 emissions. Uh, equivalent, in equivalents. Of that, the U.S. Um, contribution is about 6,700, which is about roughly 14%. So the U.S. roughly contributes about 14% of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, if you look at the, the, the relative contributions of those different greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, uh, 80%. For about 82% of this total U.S. emissions is in CO2, and then it uh, cons uh, constitutes about 10% of the methane and about 5% of the nitrous oxides. Okay, this chart we saw also a little bit earlier, but it just shows back through uh, 1990 until 2013. This is our, the total U.S. emissions. Uh, and this breaks it down by the type of uh, green or the, the Pacific greenhouse gas here also. And you don't see a whole lot of change here. You see a, a, an increase to about 2004, 2005, and then a, a small decrease uh, likely due to uh, our economy, uh, recession, and uh, less CO2. Okay, so you take that, uh, look at U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and you see what's attributed to agriculture. 
uh, it's from the EPA, agriculture contributes about 9% to those total U.S. anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And the, they categorize this as follows, agricultural soil, soil management, enteric fermentation, manure management, uh, rice cultivation, and field burning of ag residue. And so this is all the components that are incorporated into this 9% number. <clears throat> Now that we heard earlier, the, the two gases that in agriculture that we're most concerned with are, are methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, methane, about 36% of U.S. methane emissions are attributed to agriculture, and uh, about 10% is that, of that is in manure management, and 26% of the methane is from enteric fermentation. Look at nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, agriculture contributes about 79% of uh, U.S. nitrous oxide emissions, um, and that's mainly uh, due to agricultural soil management, fertilization, uh, cropping, but a small percentage of that is also attributed to manure management and land application of manure. And so overall, if you, you take agriculture being a ninth contributing you know, I've heard numbers this morning, seven, I've heard 10. These values were 9%. Okay, agriculture contributing about 9% to that. Uh, about 3% is from uh, animal agriculture. Okay, and so that's basically comes from two sources. Uh, about two thirds are from enteric fermentation and about one third is from manure management. Okay, so we went uh, you know, basically on the global, compared to the global average, U.S. contributes about 14% to that. In the U.S., 9% 9, 9 of that is attributed to agriculture. 3% of that, of, of the total, is animal agriculture. And so <clears throat> just shows you a little bit of perspective there. Okay, if we talk about uh, enteric fermentation, Basically, it's methane that's produced in ruminant animals by bacteria as a byproduct of digestion. So it's it's natural natural process. Um, it's, there's a lot of things that uh, go into that, uh, determining how much of that uh, energy is converted to methane. Uh, it depends upon the feed source, or whether it's grain versus forage. There's some pretty large discrepancies between the two. Uh, the nitrogen content in the feed plays a part that's feed rate, uh, whether or not you have feed additives added to the diet. Um, there's differences in the types of, uh, in breeds of cattle as to how efficient they are, and, and that changes with what breeds are placed in what environment. And so the environment and the breed of the cattle also uh, uh, plays a part also. in animal activity and health. And so, so are they, uh, is that animal, uh, a high maintenance animal or a low maintenance animal uh, also contributes. Okay, if we look at overall, or these are total enteric fermentation emissions in the U.S., uh, you'll see that the majority of those uh, enteric fermentation are from beef cattle, 117.1 uh, million metric tons, uh, and then followed by dairy cattle, swine, horses, sheep, and, and others. And so, this is sort of the breakdown of how, in terms of total emissions from different species of animals. Now, in, in uh, methodology used to calculate a lot of these numbers, there's a couple of different methodologies that I actually use. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, presents a few of these. They have a, what's called a Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. They get more... Uh, uh, the, the tier one is a more simplified uh, estimates on, say, for example, methane emission per, per head of cattle. Uh, these are just, they do break these down into the, to, uh, different types of animals. So you could have a beef cattle that's, uh, uh, you know, just a beef cattle. You could have some that are on pasture. Uh, you have dairy cattle, and then they have other um, uh, values for different species of animals. But in their simplified version where they're calculating 
total emissions, say, in a country from beef cattle production. The simplified, they use a value of 53 kilograms uh, methane per head per year. And so uh, these are very simplistic. Um, they do have charts, if you read into their methodology, where they break that down by country. So maybe in a different country, they would have a different value. But uh, there's very little variation in some of these simplified approaches. When they also use a, a more sophisticated uh, methodology uh, to determine uh, enteric emission factors, it's called the tier two. Um, they break it down, you know, the cattle, for example, into dairy and beef, and they'll give numbers also, you know, for calves, for cows, for re replacement animals, uh, depending on age. Um, also in beef, um, they also have uh, uh, values for bulls, stalker steers, heifer, uh, and feed, feedlot cattle. And so there's an attempt to uh, more accurately represent what some of these classifications of species and their, uh, and, and depending on what production system they're uh, growing in, there's an attempt to better define some of these values because there's a, a large variability as, as you would might think. So, okay, manure and treatment and storage. Uh, basically, that uh, the two greenhouse gases associated with that are methane and nitrous oxide. And there's a lot of different variables that you would expect that would go into this. The, the, the total amount of manure that you're dealing with, uh, the, the concentration of carbon and nitrogen in the in the manure, uh, the proportion of manure that decomposes anaerobically. So there's nitrification and denitrification processes that go, uh, you know, nitrogen transformation processes. Uh, and during that process, there's pathways for nitrogen to be lost as nitrous oxide or as ammonia, which we'll see here a little bit later, can be de uh, 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 deposited off the location and actually contribute to nitrous oxide emissions indirectly. The other thing that, that we have a, uh, there's a lot of variables that go into this, but temperature is, is a, a big one. So uh, the temperature of the manure, the temperature that's being stored, uh, temperature uh, of the ground that it's being applied on, if you're land applying it, uh, there's a lot of variables there. And then the duration and type of storage. We've heard about some of those a little bit earlier, uh, but all of those different types of storage and management, uh, manure management techniques have trade-offs when it comes to uh, uh, methane and nitrous oxide emissions. You may increase methane emissions while in an attempt to actually decrease nitrous oxide emissions or vice versa. So there are a lot of trade-offs there. If we look at uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by uh, type of animal and look at uh, methane and nitrous oxide, you'll see that in dairy cattle, uh, they have a overall in the U.S. The amount of greenhouse gases emitted by dairy cattle are, are smaller compared to, say, beef. But if you look at manure management, uh, that portion is higher. And the largest uh, portion of that is through methane and then a smaller portion through nitrous oxide emissions, mainly uh, dealing with the manure management aspect of that. Like I mentioned, there's, there's pathways for direct uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, we did a, a literature review, uh, Dr. Uh, Saka Mukhtar and I, uh, a couple of years ago, or I, I guess last year, where we looked at, uh, it was a basically a literature review looking at uh, subsurface application of manure and found that in most of the field studies, uh, it was up to 3% of the applied in was emitted as uh, nitrous oxide uh, when we looked at uh, subsurface application of manure. And some of the, the largest contributing factors of that were the amount of water soluble carbon, soil moisture and temperature, the actual form of the nitrogen that was being applied, and several other uh, different uh, uh, variables. One of these is application method. There's a lot of variability depending on the, the type of application method that was being used. Um, uh, even the different types of subsurface and application methods that are being used. 
Also, you have the potential for uh, indirect nitrous oxide emissions um, as through uh, uh, volatilization of nitrogen and deposition downstream. They're seeing a lot of this uh, uh, results of this, not necessarily nitrous oxide emissions, but in, in nitrates here in the uh, Colorado Rockies where this is occurring. So those are sort of some general numbers that are published uh, through the EPA and the IPCC, but there's been a lot of really good research going on up here. Uh, you know, Wendy Powers has done a lot of research on this, and they're looking at within uh, a dairy system, there's several different, you know, pathways uh, for greenhouse gases emissions or different, several different sources. And so there is a, a literature reviews that are accessible now that just came out, out like, I think it's a 2014, that talk about uh, some of these. But uh, they looked at, uh, you know, enteric fermentation, the different types of manure storage structures, liquid manure systems, anaerobic digesters, uh, on-farm energy consumption and production inefficiency, just being a few of those sources within a, a, a typical dairy farm where emissions may occur. And so this is a sort of a literature, of, or this was done by uh, Wendy Silver and uh, Owen in 2015. So this is very recent where they did a literature review of the field studies where they measured uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions on dairy farms at different parts, you know, different parts of the uh, locations in the farm. And then there was a, a portion of that literature review that dealt with the, where they looked at greenhouse emissions at a whole barn level and a whole dairy level. And so there's, you can see there's a lot of, uh, you know, variability or differences in, in greenhouse emissions depending on where you're measuring at on the farm. And they, uh, the field studies don't necessarily add up if you're looking at a whole barn system, uh, it looked like the numbers in these studies were a whole lot lower than what you would actually calculate if you looked at it on individual aspects of that farm. And so there's still a lot of uncertainty here, and, uh, but uh, this is a place to start. So look at greenhouse gas mitigation. Why should we care? Uh, you know, only use, only uh, responsible for about 3%, so why is that important? Well, a lot of the mitigation practices can also be economically, environmentally be beneficial. So they have, there's some win-win alternatives here. Uh, emissions can be associated with lost productivity, especially if we're talking about you know, loss of nitrogen or, uh, or nitrogen that we apply that can't be recovered and util utilized. Um, there's beginning to be a, a market demand for low carbon footprint products, and so there's uh, there's options uh, for uh, some of the products. And greenhouse gas reductions may become a source for future emission credits or uh, carbon offsets. And we've seen several attempts here in the U.S. that uh, kind of flopped, but um, they keep coming up. You know, so California is, is has their uh, system that you're using, carbon market system. And so um, agriculture really isn't a big part of that yet, but I believe it, it probably will be. And so if you're a business, if you're in business, then there's different drivers uh, for greenhouse gas reductions, uh, whether it be government policy, whether it be consumer demand, or a technology innovation. Okay, and as a business, you sort of have to look at the risks involved with greenhouse gas emissions, um, climate change policy risks, there's market risks, uh, you have to consider the climate change impacts, uh, risk to reputation if you're, if you're one of those who aren't following best practices, um, credit risk and, and financial risk as well. So some of the business actions that might be taken uh, or at adaptation where you comply with regulations or realize uh, efficiencies. 
You'll see the opportunity for new investments, investing in specific technologies and markets, and uh, the potential also for new revenue streams that accompany some of these uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation practices. So if we look at some of the, the different strategies for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emission, I guess the biggest one that we've heard from Dr. Mittlinger today was is increasing production efficiency and uh, really doing and good in that particular job uh, aspect. Uh, manure management, energy efficiency, and carbon capture and storage. So these are the, the big four, really, if you want to categorize them, uh, opportunities for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, we heard about uh, the increased efficiency in our milk yields. Uh, that number's been reported earlier. Uh, different approaches to reducing methane per unit of milk on an individual cow basis and on a herd basis. Basically, if we can, if we can at least hold or increase our milk production while reducing our maintenance energy demands, then we'll increase uh, our, our uh, our efficiency. Reducing the methane from enteric fermentation, there's a lot of different options there as well. Increasing digestibility of the forage is the most important one. Supplementing poor to medium quality diets with concentrates. And then there's a lot of uh, room in chemistry and biology alternatives that are being investigated. Some of them are, are showing promise, the ionophores being one of those. Uh, increasing genetics. Uh, you know, increasing the lifetime productivity, having that cow produce for a longer period of time, produce calves over a lot, uh, several more years. Management and fertility, uh, it's still have a lot of way, a lot, a lot of room to, to, to improve there, but increasing, uh, in improving the overall herd health or reducing the death loss, improving health and performance as an important one. So I'm going to skip through some of these. So uh, all of this information is included in the proceedings. There's a couple of different fact sheets that accompany this presentation that are also uh, posted on our Animal Ag and Climate Change website. Is in addition to some uh, videos and a lot of different resources if you're looking at uh, greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. Uh, if you look at manure management, there's composting of solids, uh, passive, extensive, or intensive composting of solids. Aeration may re reduce methane, but increase N2O and, and uh, ammonia emissions. So with, all, with these processes, like I mentioned earlier, there are trade-offs where you can increase one and or decrease one greenhouse gas, but actually result in increase in another. And so you have to do a little bit more research. Covering manure piles, uh, separating solid and liquid, capturing methane. Well, we've seen this all today. So, anaerobic digestion, which of course has other benefits, odor control, uh, renewable energy generation, can be a potential revenue source, uh, and it can also conversion of nutrients from organic to inorganic form can be readily available. In land application, there's some uh, greenhouse gas mitigation strategies there, applying composted manure, reducing the initial nitrogen concentration before, prior to applying it, avoiding applications to wet soils, maintaining pH, uh, applying or moving manure below the surface. There's a lot of different uh, strategies that go along with land application that could help and reduce it. So we'll do this pretty quickly, but Again, all of this, all this material and even in more depth are included in, in the proceedings. So in summary, uh, direct greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. livestock industry is relatively small compared to the other economic uh, uh, sources or sectors. It's less than or around 3% of the total emissions. However, the relative contribution of non-CO2 greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide, is pretty substantial. And so... You know, that's the reason we sort of get a lot of attention sometimes is the comp relative contribution of some of these other uh, non-CO2 gases. And investments in greenhouse gas mitigation strategies can offer additional agronomic and final financial benefits, uh, particularly uh, uh, in anaerobic 
uh, digestion systems and some of the composted systems also. So again, this is a, a part of this animal ag and climate change project. If you want any of this information, there's a lot more detail on our website, a lot of good videos and, and, and fact sheets and publications. Thank you.